Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today we'll be tinkerers in a workshop fixing a mysterious clock machine. We'll be trying to claim the right parts so we can build contraptions from blueprints that are lying around the workshop. Today we're taking a look at Gearworks, which is a steampunk strategy card game featuring card placement, hand management, and a twist on area control. It's up for 1 to 4 players, takes 30 to 45 minutes to play, and is for ages 10 and up, and published by Peacekeeper Games. Today we'll be doing a rule school, where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rulebook yourself. Now I've placed timestamps just below me in the description of this video, just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Without further ado, let's get started. Gearworks is a 1 to 4 player game where each of you will be one of these tinkerers in the workshop. And you'll be trying to build contraptions like butterflies, phonographs, and goggles by using the parts or part that's needed in order to build it. And you'll be gathering those parts by playing cards in a grid with certain rules that will allow you to control certain rows and columns and if you control them at the end of the round you'll be getting those specific parts. But the twist is you can only have the same color once in each column and each row has to go in a specific ascending or descending order. And certain things will allow you to gain sparks which you'll use as a form of currency to spend to break some of the rules of the game. And each of the tinkerers has a special ability which you can use once per round to give the game extra flavor. There's also a two player setup that keeps the board tight and there's a solo version for all of us solo gamers. Gearworks has simple mechanisms, but lots of depth and replayability for gamer enthusiasts or casual gamers. I'm going to show you how to set up for a 3 or 4 player game. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to set up the 2 player rules and the solo game, but even if you're playing in one of those two types of games, I suggest you watch through the entire video because much of what I'm going to show you will not change. First find the 9 gear tokens. You're going to find ones that have A through E and 1 through 4. You'll use these to create a 5x4 grid. Five columns using the letters going in alphabetical order, A through E from left to right, and a column going from 1 to 4, top to bottom. And you'll want to keep them spaced out so that the cards will be able to fit in each of these spots of the grid. Then find the gear cards. You're going to shuffle these up and you're going to place them beside the grid where they're easy to reach. You're then going to draw four cards from here and in the order that they're drawn you're going to be placing them out into the grid. First in A2, then in B1. Notice that it leaves the top leftmost card of the grid empty. Then in grid spot D4 and then E3, noticing that the bottom right spot of the grid in E4 is empty. Next, you'll locate all the different part types and stack them next to the corresponding gear token beside the grid. For example, this is number 4, it goes at number 4, and it also shows the icon of what that part is. And you'll do this for all the numbers and letters as shown. You'll also place all the sparks near the deck of gear cards that you've already placed, and you're also going to shuffle up and place the contraption cards next to that deck. Next, give each player one of these tinkerers, making sure it's face up, meaning you can actually read the ability below the name. Any tinkerers not being used in this game can be removed from the game and placed back in the box. Then each player next to their tinkerer is going to get five gear cards face down, one contraption card face down, a player aid that is double sided, and one spark. You're then going to determine the first player, and that's going to be the player who most recently fixed something that was broken. Now, if you're playing with four players, the last player in turn order will also get an additional second spark. The object of the game is to have the most points at the end of the game, and you'll be getting points by completing contraptions, sometimes with both parts that are needed, sometimes even with just one part that's needed, and you'll also be getting points by having parts that you didn't end up using in contraptions, as well as leftover sparks that you have not spent throughout the game. The game is played over three rounds. Each round, players are going to be taking turns in clockwise order until all players have consecutively passed. Now I've shown you how to set up the game on the table and the game can easily be played on a standard table. However, I'm going to transition to showing you this game on a play mat because it will help me facilitate teaching the game to you a little bit easier. 
Now this mat does not come with the game, it is available for an additional purchase. When it's your turn, you can simply either play a gear card or pass. When placing a gear card, one of the ways to do this is to place it on one of the empty spots that does not have a card anywhere on the grid. However, when doing so, you have to make sure that it's the only color in that column. For example, I could not place this here because it's the same color of at least one other card that's in that column. Now, there's also these icons that can also reflect the color if you are colorblind. So by placing this card, it's a valid placement because there's no other card in that column that has that color. Then we look at the row order. Before I placed this, this was the only card in this row. Now when I place the second card in this row, we're going to start to see what order this row is going in. Is it going ascending from left to right, or is it going in the opposite direction? When you place this second card, if it's a different number than the card that's already there, it will help determine this. For example, we now know it's going to be going ascending left to right. So by doing that, we want to orient the cards so that the arrows are pointing in the ascending order that this card row is going. Which means on a future play, someone could not play this five card here because it needs to be going in ascending order of what's already there. However, you could place a four card there because you can always place a card of a matching number next to one another. And notice it's okay to have the same color in the same row, just never in the same column. Then, if the gears that correspond with that grid placement have not been flipped, go ahead and flip them, and then make it so that the color of your tinkerer is facing that card. For example, we're the red player, so we have the red pointing to both of these. If either or both of those gears were already flipped, just turn it so that the color matches whatever tinkerer you are facing the card that you just placed. This indicates that that player currently has control of that row and column. It would then be the next player's turn because you're either playing a gear card or passing. If you decide to pass, take your tinkerer card and put it sideways like this to indicate that you've passed. If all players successfully pass, then the round has ended. Now there is a way to get back in after passing, but we'll go over that in just a moment. Keep in mind when playing a gear card, it can be played at any open spot on the board. But let's say we place it here. This is a legal placement because this color is not duplicated anywhere in this column. And we're now setting the order in this row. In this case, the arrows are going to the right. We'll keep them that way because we're going to be going in ascending order left to right. Now this means that the card that goes here has to be either a 6, a 7, or 8. A 7 because it's going in ascending order. A 6 or an 8 because a card can always be next to another card with the same number. However, when you play a card, you can tinker. How this works is you, from the card that you placed, you look in all four directions and look at the very next card you see. In this direction, there's no cards. That's fine. In this direction, we go here, it's a four. Here we go up here, it's a two. Here we go over here and it's an eight. You take any two of the values of those cards, the closest in all four directions, and you either add any two of them or subtract any two of them. And if that number equals the number that you've placed, you've successfully tinkered. So in this case, we have a four and a two. We can add those up, that adds up to six, so that is a successful tinker. That allows you to gain an additional spark. And when gaining sparks, you can never have more than five at any given time. The other way to gain a spark is to discard any two gear cards face down to the bottom of the deck, and you'll get one spark for that. And you can do this as many times as you want on your turn. What can you do with these sparks? There's four different ways you can spend sparks. One of them is to replace a gear card. On your turn, when you play a gear card, before we were showing you placing it in any of these open areas. Well, you can spend two sparks to the supply. You'd spend them and put them right here. And then you can play on top of another gear card. Now, all the other placement rules still exist, and you cannot tinker with this card that's been played on top. So even though this is a six, we cannot get a spark for tinkering, even though the four and the two add up to six. Earlier I mentioned that if you pass as a way to get back in the game, assuming that all the other players did not successfully pass, which would have ended the round. So if it comes back to your turn after you've passed and there's at least one other player in, you can spend a spark back to the supply to get back into the round. You can then immediately take your turn as normal. You can also spend one spark to the supply to gain a gear card to your hand. You can do this as many times during your turn as you want, as long as you have the sparks to spend, and you can do it any time during your turn. However, there is a hand limit of eight gear cards and you can never have more than eight cards in your hand at any given time. 
The last thing you can do with spending sparks is you spend two to the supply to gain a contraption card. And you can do this as many times as you want on your turn and any time during your turn, obviously assuming that you have enough sparks to spend. And keep in mind that one side of your player aid does talk about spending sparks and how much they are and what you can do. Once all players have successfully passed, that's the end of the round, and at that point, nobody can spend more sparks to re-enter the round. First players will claim parts. You look at each column and row, and you'll see which player by color is controlling that row. That player will be able to take the part corresponding with that column or row and place it in front of them. And as this is being done, you then flip the token back over face down. Then all players can reveal contraption cards that they'd like to build this round. Now each contraption card has two things that it needs, and it only needs at least one of those to be built. For example, this needs either an A, which is a wheel, or the number one, the little winder there. In this case, we have both, so we can show that we could build this with both of these. And then we would just place this off to the side with the parts used to build it. However, if I did not have the phonograph, but in this case had the goggles, we have the winder, which is what it needs. I did not have the magnifying glass E, but I have a wheel left over that I'm not using. In this case, you'll place the unused part and the contraption with the part that was used to build it with just one to the side. No parts from previous rounds can be used to build your contraptions. Nor can you add parts from future rounds to previously built contraptions. Then you'll reset your tinkerer. Now, if you did not use the special ability on the bottom, you'll get one spark. We'll go over what all these are later in the video. And if your tinkerer was flipped over by using its special ability that we'll talk about later, when you reset them, you'd flip them back over to the side shown here. Next, you'll reset up the grid. And you'll do that by taking all the cards on the grid, shuffling them with the gear deck and placing four new cards out in those starting locations. You'll then deal five more gear cards out to every player, making sure that if they still have cards left over from previous rounds, you never go over eight cards. Next, you'll determine the leader, and you'll do this by counting all the total parts that each player has, either unused or in contraptions. If there's a tie, break that tie by whoever has the most sparks, and if it's still tied, the most gear cards in hand. And that leader will be the first player in the following round. Then each player with less parts than the leader will gain sparks according to this table. There is a variant that you can play by skipping this step by not giving out any sparks to any players. You'll play out the second and third rounds just like I showed you in the first round. At the end of the third round, you'll still claim parts by controlling certain rows and columns. You can still build new contraptions with the parts that you've gained that round. And you'll still reset your tinkerer and get a spark if you did not use the special ability. You'll then go through final scoring, and you can see this at the bottom of your player aid. Now for each of the contraptions that you've built with both parts, you'll get the nine points. For each contraption with just one of the parts, you'll get four points. For any unused parts, you'll get two points, and each spark is worth one point. So here I have 17 points. If it's tied, the player with the most different types of parts would win. In this case, I have three different types of parts. If it's still tied, the tie player with the most sets of three of the same parts win. Now each of these tinkerers has a special ability that you can use once per round. And when you use that special ability, you flip the card over to remember that you've already used it. Bartleby allows you to draw three cards from the gear deck, keep one of them, and place the other ones face down at the bottom of that deck. Wyatt allows you to slide a gear card in a row. And when doing this, you have to make sure all placement rules are still followed, like not having the same color in the same column. And this might allow them to do something like that. And when sliding, if there's a card underneath that one, it goes along with it. Also, you cannot tinker, which we talked about earlier, and you cannot rotate or flip any of the gears that are in the column or rows that you've slid that card to. Jade allows you to alter the number on a gear card by one or two, either lower or higher, but you cannot wrap it back around, like moving a nine to a one, for example. Now, you may not use this ability if you're spending two sparks to replace another gear card that's there. However, when you place this, you place it sideways. This one, let's say we added two to it, so now it's a four, so it can go here, and you place it sideways like that. This shows that it should not be used for determining ascending or descending numerical order. However, you can tinker with this card, but it's the printed number, not the modified number. Victoria allows you to ignore the column color rule. 
For example, you could play this when you normally could because that column already has that color. And you cannot use this when spending two sparks to replace on top of another gear card. In the two player setup, you're going to be removing some cards and components from the game and placing them back in the box. Those are any of the contraptions that have the letter E on them, the actual E gear that was used to set up the grid, and the E magnifying glass tokens. You're also going to go through the gear deck and find all of the 8s and 9s, remove all these components from the game, and put them back in the box. In each round, the four locations in the grid that you'll be placing the cards to seed the board are A2, B1, C4, and D3. Again, leaving those top left and bottom right corners empty. Setting up the solo game is an extension to setting up the two-player game. So just go back to the previous section just a couple of seconds ago and watch how to set up the two-player game. In addition to that, you'll also remove the contraption cards that have a dot in the bottom right of them and place them back in the box. You'll then actually grab the E gear that we took out for the two-player game because you'll be using it here. You're going to flip it over face up and you're going to set a color facing you for the Leviathan. So if we wanted the Leviathan to be black, we would face it this way. You get the Leviathan card, it's double sided, and you'll place it on the side depending on uh, the level that you want to start at. We recommend easier medium for your first solo games. In this case, it would be three points per part for easy, or you could flip this over and it would be four points per part for medium. Now in this version, you, the human player, will play as normal, except you don't get any sparks at the end of the round. At the beginning of the round, Leviathan's going to get a certain amount of sparks depending on the round and what level you have. In this case, easy round one is going to be seven sparks. Now you'll go first, followed by the Leviathan. And when it's the Leviathan's turn, they will spend a spark. If they don't have any left, they must pass. The Leviathan plays on a grid by flipping contraption cards to determine the column and row where it plays and flipping gear cards to find a valid card to play. Now you're going to flip the top contraption card from the deck and first look at the column and see if Leviathan can play there. Now we look at column D and sure there's a place that he can play and then we look at one and yes they can play so we would use this card. If you could not place in D then you would flip another card from the deck continue doing so until you can play in that column then look at the number for the row. If you cannot go on the row, then you continue flipping cards until you can get a number that you can play on. But if there is only one empty row in the column in which the Leviathan can play, in that case you'd eventually find that row number, but it would waste some time so the player just skips the extra flips and plays in the only open spot in that column. Then we take the top card off the gear deck and we place it in that location. If it can be placed, it has to follow the same placement rules and this can be placed. But now that it's going in ascending order, we would flip it up like this. If this card can tinker, then you would do that as well and gain a spark for Leviathan. And of course you would then take the Leviathan color and take the gears from that and point it to that row and column. Now if this card was here, this could not be placed here because it's in the same column of the same color. You would then draw the next card and you would keep doing this until it can play one or it reaches its flip limit. And that flip limit depends on which level you have Leviathan at. Now if the location is already occupied by a gear card and there's four or fewer spaces, then Leviathan must spend a spark and play on top of that gear card. And if he doesn't have enough sparks, he must pass. And as you can see, there's different levels where the human player may use their special ability or not. At the end of the game, Leviathan will get a certain amount of points depending on how many parts he has, and then also get two points for each spark, and then you see if you can beat him or not. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into Gearworks and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, if you have further questions below me, I've placed a link in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Peacekeeper Games.